I speak to urge this Congress to adopt the resolution titled Build the International Workers' Alliance of Rank-and-File Committees for a Global Counter-Offensive of the Working Class. The passage of this resolution would be an important step forward for the party and for the working class. The IWA RFC is the necessary initiative for facilitating the democratic self-organization of rank-and-file workers and to unleash the independent strength of the working class on a world scale. The necessity of the IWA RFC for the international working class is being confirmed by the experiences of the party since its foundation in May of 2021. The IWA RFC and its affiliated committees are the organizational form through which the billion-strong modern world proletariat will articulate its interests, unite across national boundaries, and bring the decades-long social counter-revolution to an end. Through the IWA RFC, the working class will gain consciousness of its role as the progressive social force to launch, broaden, and sustain a globally coordinated counteroffensive capable of cutting a path to world social re socialist revolution. In his opening report, Comrade North emphasized that the party is not preparing for some future crisis, but rather that a crisis of epical proportions is already well underway. The capitalist class is dragging the world from catastrophe to ever greater catastrophe. The war, the pandemic, the economic crisis, the collapse of bourgeois democracy, the scarcity of food, the environmental destruction of the planet, all make clear that the capitalist class is going to sacrifice billions of people, is willing to risk wiping out all of human civilization, to erase all of our advances in production, in art, in music, in science, in order to protect the wealth it has amassed through centuries of exploitation. We are correct to stress the profound dangers that arise from this crisis. We must sound the alarm. But any sense of fatalism or hopelessness about the present situation would be entirely out of place and profoundly damaging to the interests of the working class and to the fate of the revolution. We will leave self-pity to the petty bourgeois types for whom resignation is a justification for the abandonment of those principles that get in the way of a nice and easy life. Such an attitude has nothing to do with reality. We understand that there is a way out of the crisis, and that the greater the degree of recklessness, desperation, and of madness in the conduct of the ruling class, the more ripe or overripe conditions are for the revolutionary transformation of society. That is the starting point for Marxists. The dangers are great, but the working class of the 21st century is the most economically powerful internationally interconnected and technologically advanced working class the world has ever known. The existing productive forces are so advanced, the scientific gains of mankind are so impressive, that the permanent elimination of scarcity is possible if the productive forces can be freed from private ownership and the nation-state system. The exponentially rapid development of technology over the last 30 years and in particular the rise of cheap mass access to the internet and to a similar extent large container shipping have transformed social existence. In the last decade this objective social process has found expression in three great insurrectionary waves which have spread across the world each enveloping more and more people in more and more countries than the last. These upsurges make clear that all the political parties of the capitalist class and all the forces relied on to suppress the class struggle over the course of the 20th century have lost their ability to suppress the class struggle. The Stalinists, the Social Democrats, the trade unions and bourgeois nationalists are viewed by this young and urban international working class as responsible for their deplorable conditions. The common turn no longer exists to suffocate and misdirect the workers' movement as it did during the revolutionary upheaval of the 1930s, whose defeat set, set the stage for the Great Terror, World War II, the Holocaust, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today, each wave shows the powerful and growing egalitarian and revolutionary aspirations of masses of people, while also making clear 
that these aspirations cannot be met on the basis of spontaneous anger alone. The first wave was the 2011 Arab Spring, which involved tens of millions of people across the Maghreb. The second was the mass protests of 2018 and 19, which involved hundreds of millions and was not limited to any one region. It took place in dozens of countries, including Chile, Lebanon, Sudan, Iraq, Ecuador, France, and many other places. The second wave of spontaneous protest carried forward the unmet grievances from the first, in an even more explosive form. But like the Arab Spring, this second wave did not result in any lasting change to the living conditions of masses of people. The ruling class responded to this pressure from below, not by making society more democratic, not by making economic concessions, but by cracking skulls. Leon Trotsky described periods such as this as periods of the highest flowering of the counter-revolutionary strategy of the bourgeoisie. We must understand this clearly and precisely, Trotsky wrote. Counter-revolutionary strategy, i.e. the art of waging a combined struggle against the proletariat by every method, from saccharine professional clerical preachments to the machine gunning of strikers, has never attained such heights as it does today. In our January 2020 statement, the decade of socialist revolution begins. Comrades Kishore and North cite a quotation from a leading intelligence firm which referenced the emergence of what they called leaderless revolutions in the wake of the social protest that swept the world from 2018 to 2019 on the eve of the pandemic. But our task is to ensure that the emerging global upsurge does not remain leaderless. Leaderless revolutions fail. In his 1921 speech to the Third Congress of the Comintern, titled The School of Revolutionary Strategy, Trotsky put it the following way. The bourgeoisie, even though it finds itself in a complete contradiction with the demands of historical progress, nevertheless still maintains the most power, still remains the most powerful class. More than that, it may be said that politically the bourgeoisie attains its greatest powers, its greatest concentration of forces and resources, of political and military means of deception, of coercion and provocation, i.e. the flowering of its class strategy, at the moment when it is most immediately threatened by social ruin. The war and its terrible consequences, and the war sprang precisely from the fact that the productive forces had no room to develop further within the framework of bourgeois society. The war and its consequences have confronted the bourgeoisie with the terrible threat of destruction. This has rendered its instinct of class self-preservation sensitive in the extreme. The greater the danger, all the more does the class, like the individual, exert its vital forces in the struggle for self-preservation. They act the more resourcefully, cunningly, ruthlessly, all the more clearly the leaders take cognizance of the threatening danger. Armed with this understanding, the socialist equality faces the emergence of a third wave of revolutionary upheavals. We are not a party that waits for revolution to emerge automatically. Instead, we are a revolution-making party. Today, after the shock of the pandemic, this third wave of social protest is even more powerful than the first two. Intensified by the devastating social, economic, and personal impact of the pandemic on billions of people, of war-related shortages, and increasingly common extreme weather events caused by climate change, this wave of protest will involve not millions or hundreds of millions of people, but billions of them. This world movement is not going to be isolated to any country or region. It is emerging rapidly, in the span of weeks. Lenin and Trotsky said after the Russian Revolution that capitalism was breaking at its weakest link, but now workers are marching under banners written in all the languages of the world. This movement has united the very poorest informal workers in the global south with workers employed in the most advanced industries in the centers of world imperialism. And it is not a question of one link breaking. Instead, the whole chain is coming undone. The working class has passed through critical experiences in these three waves of social protest. The demands of the growing movement of the working class are not merely over contract issues, but over fundamental social questions. Political issues are coming more and more to the fore. Sri Lanka is the tip of the spear of this process. 
and the Sri Lankan masses are the first to begin to pose the social question which was posed by the Russian workers in 1917 and which will soon be on the minds and on the tongues of billions. Which class shall rule? The answer to this question will be determined by the work of our party in the coming period. The work of the Socialist Equality Party is the decisive factor in the resolution of the world crisis of capitalism. The experiences of the party show that achievements which would have been impossible in an earlier period are now possible, but they are not inevitable. They take place only when we fight for them, when we refuse to underestimate ourselves and what we can accomplish, when we systematically intervene in the struggles of the working class and fight alongside workers to show them why and what they are fighting and to win them to socialism. This assessment must lead to a development of the work of the party, of its branches, and to the work of each individual comrade. And this report is aimed at supporting the resolution to build the IWA RFC, and not as a timely tactical maneuver, but as a necessary element of the strategy of World Socialist Revolution. <laughs> the International Workers' Alliance of Rank-and-File Committees is the organizational form that corresponds to the social character of the global working class of the 21st century. From 1980 to 2020, the development of the world's productive forces increased the size of the working class by 3 billion people. A majority of the world's population now lives in cities for the first time in world history, and this figure rises by the millions each week. Billions of workers have moved from the backward countryside of India, China, Latin America, and Africa into the megacities, and they have leapt forward centuries in single lifetimes in terms of their social existence. There will be an estimated 1 billion African workers who enter the global labor force in the decades ahead. 90% of the world's trade flows through a few dozen cities, the world's largest megacities, where the working class occupies a position of immense potential power and is connected by the global process of production to workers in every corner of the world. In these cities, where inequality is laid out starkly for all to see and experience every day, the concentration of the working class gives them a power far greater than the sum of its parts. As the UK's Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors wrote, quote, urban areas can be epicenters of far-reaching change, whirlwinds of activity and learning and drivers of change, but they're, if they're also uncontrolled, they can act as a distillation of enormous risk and potential instability. And where does the revolution start? always in the cities. That's the assessment made by British intelligence. Just as slow and belated economic development fueled separatism and centrifugal tendencies in an earlier period of the growth of capitalism, today the process of globalization has done the opposite. It is creating similarities in living conditions across the world and forging the basis of unity in the social outlook of masses of people, regardless of nationality, race, or ethnicity. This objective process has undermined the political basis for separatism and nationalism, making them seem archaic and irrational, and facilitating the breakdown of the domination of the national trade unions and capitalist parties. Breathtaking technological advances have also transformed the economy and opened new horizons for the development of political consciousness and of human culture. Information and knowledge are now available on a scale whose social significance outpaces even that of the invention of Gutenberg's printing press on the thinking of the peasant masses of the 16th century in Europe. The democratic essence of social media, constrained as it is by a corporate ownership of the various platforms, has so far released only a tiny percentage of its revolutionary potential. And even this has been enough to help trigger the waves of mass protests that we have just been discussing. And just as the printing press exploded the clergy's monopoly on information, introduced the masses of exploited peasants to Luther's Bible, and triggered what was at that point the greatest revolutionary movement in world history, so today via the internet, the World Socialist website, which is a beacon of truth in a world of lies, is lighting more and more cell phones and computer screens and enlightening the rapidly opening minds of workers all over the world. From 2000 to 2020, nearly 5 billion people accessed the internet for the first time, dealing an immense blow to national parochialism, social backwardness, illiteracy, 
and the legacy of rural superstition. The time it took Twitter to reach 50 million users, for example, was nine months. It took the television 13 years to reach that many people, and radio 38 years. Lenin, writing in his work, The Development of Capitalism in Russia, recognized the profoundly revolutionary implications of the developments of the national Russian economy and the emergence of a powerful urban working class out of the old agrarian and rural society. He wrote, all the changes referred to which capitalism brings about in the old economic system inevitably lead also to a change in the spiritual makeup of the population. The sporadic character of economic development, the rapid change in the methods of production, and the enormous concentration of production, the disappearance of all forms of personal dependence and patriarchal relations, the mobility of the, popu of the population, the influence of the big industrial centers, etc., all this cannot but bring about a profound change in the very character of the working class. Lenin wrote these words in 1899 when the Russian working class consisted of a tiny portion of the population that was overwhelmingly rural and illiterate. But today in the 21st century, the change in the character of the working class, its spiritual makeup, as Lenin so richly put it, is even more profound. The past 20 years have witnessed an ever-expanding and increasingly global movement of the working class. As the authors of the recent study, World Protests, a study of key protest issues in the 21st century, note, quote, there are times in history when large numbers of people protest about the way things are, demanding change. It happened in 1830 to 1848, in 1917 to 24, in the 1960s, and it is happening again today, end quote. From the Arab Spring to the mass protests of the 2018-19 to the explosive protests of early 2022, hundreds of millions of workers have entered into the class struggle. In India, a 2020 general strike involved 250 million workers, the largest strike in history by an order of magnitude and more than the total population of all but four countries on Earth. According to the World Protests authors, not only has the number of demonstrations increased steadily, but protests have become more political due to disappointments with malfunctioning democracies, frustration with politicians, and a lack of trust in governments. The authors note that single-issue protests have been replaced by omnibus protests in which demonstrators raise demands related to many issues. The authors add, there are also a number of international and global protests that happen in multiple countries simultaneously, and their number also keeps increasing steadily over the years. The authors explain, how did these grievances evolve over time? Beginning in 2006, there is a steady rise in the overall protests each year up to 2020. Though generalizing is difficult, they say, as the global financial crisis begins to unfold in 2007-08, we observe an initial jump in the number of protests. Protests intensified with the end of fiscal stimulus and the adoption of austerity cuts and cost-saving reforms worldwide after 2010. Uh, and they then peaked in 2012 and 13. Protests were primarily demanding, demonstrating for economic justice and anti-austerity reforms in the 2010 to 14 period, unresolved grievances, few decent jobs, poor social protection and public services, and failures of agrarian and tax justice caused protests to become more political, sparking a new wave of protests starting in 2016, catalyzed by the failures of democracies. Since 2016, protests have ex escalated, becoming omnibus protests against the political and economic system. Decades of neoliberal policies have generated more inequality, eroded incomes and welfare to both the lower and the middle classes, that's the working class, fueling frustration and feelings of injustice, disappointment with malfunctioning democracies, and failures of economic and social development, and a lack of trust in governments, as we've said. In 2020, the coronavirus pandemic has accentuated social unrest, end quote. The analysts then make another observation. They say the following. Our analysis shows that in the 2010 to 14 period, protesters primarily demonstrated for economic justice and against anti-austerity cuts. However, when these grievances were ignored, frustration set in due to the lack of jobs, inadequate social protection, the other 
factors which we've mentioned. And they go on to say that this created a new wave of protests, that this trend manifested itself in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Latin America, but is to be found in every region. And in the Middle East and North Africa, this tendency is even observed twice, they say. There was a first inflection point in 2011 uh, and another in 2019. And that's again beginning once more in the beginning of uh, 2022 with the outbreak of the U.S.-NATO war in, um, in Ukraine. Uh, but in these instances, the authors write, protest events related to economic justice were very numerous right up until the protests against political failures exceeded them. That's very important. This makes absolutely clear that the working class is looking for answers to the most fundamental political questions. This shows the importance of the IWA RFC and the fight to introduce socialism and politics, revolutionary politics, into the struggles of the working class. Over the decades in which the working class has grown immensely in size and economic weight, the national trade unions have not only failed to win a hearing, they have universally suffered declining membership and a collapse in legitimacy. This isn't to suggest that workers in the trade unions are insignificant or that our movement should make them secondary in terms of our strategy, but the percentage of workers who belong to trade unions has fallen drastically on a global scale from 36% of the international workforce in 1990 to just 18% in 2016. In the US, a third of private sector workers were unionized in 1970, but just 6% are today. In West Africa, 35% of workers were unionized in 1990, but only 10% are now. Same in Southeast Asia and the Arab world where the rate fell from 28% in 1980 to 12% and 7% respectfully. And in Western Europe, once home to capitalism's most powerful trade unions, the rate of unionization fell from 40% in 1980 to less than 20% today. This only partly expresses the changing class character of these organizations. There was a 2020 empirical study which noted that middle class and upper middle class employees dominate the trade unions in the bulk of European imperialist powers, including Germany, France, the Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden. They, the authors of that study wrote, in these countries, employees from the working class form less than 50% of the unionized employees. And in the US, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, four million of the country's union members belong to management and professional occupations, while 7.7% work in the public sector, compared to just 1.2 million in manufacturing, 1.1 million in transportation, and 2.3 million in the service industry. In country after country, the so-called union wage premium is also collapsing. There was a 2020 study published by Dartmouth College which noted that in the UK, quote, pay settlements in the private sector by the end of the 1990s were no greater where trade unions were involved than in their absence, end quote. The wage premium in the US has been slowing as well. Annual wage growth in the U.S. was just 4.5% in 2021, according to the census. Real wages for unionized workers rose below that rate, just 3.3%, significantly lower than for non-union wages, as unions signed multi-year contracts, which locked in wage rises far below the current rate of inflation, that is pay cuts. As the working class grew more powerful and interconnected, the trade unions, rooted in the nation-state system and the imperialist state, unconsciously uh, determined their emerging power by undermined their emerging power by carrying out decades of betrayal. Precisely when the objective power of the working class was growing, the trade unions weakened them, and their national character made it impossible to respond to the globalization of production. Over this period, the trade unions allied with their governments and national corporations in a global race to undermine wages and slash benefits. And in every country, the trade unions entered into corporatist alliances with the governments and became appendages of the companies and the state. On a world scale, millions of union executives worldwide form a distinct parasitic social layer recognizable within the capitalist political establishment of each country. There are growing concerns in the ruling circles that the trade unions will be unable to prevent the explosion of social opposition emerging in the new working class of the 21st century. Take this June 2022 working paper from the International Labor Organization 
a global analysis of worker protest and digital labor platforms, which includes ride sharing, delivery, other low wage, semi formal apps. The global label, labor platform industry, the authors of this paper write, quote, does not fit easily into establishment frameworks of labor relations. Formal employment and collective bargaining are rare and rates of unionization low. Some platform union workers are organized in traditional unions, most commonly in parts of Europe, but there has also been the growth of a much smaller uh, layer of new unions. Other platform workers, most notably in the Global South, organize informally in ad hoc groups drawn together around specific grievances. As a result, platform worker discontent is difficult to capture by conventional means, they write. Um, now, this report analyzed about 1,300 instances of worker protests in the last three years, and they conclude uh, as follows. Our findings underline that the remarkable upsurge of labor organization and militancy in platform work is driven from below by process of workers' self-organization. In the 1,300 protest events we identified, there was evidence of union involvement in only a small minority of cases. In the Global South, their involvement was even less. We also found that platform workers adopt a range of protest methods, some familiar, some less so, and with considerable variation across different global regions. Much more predominant were the emergence of what the authors of this study call workers' groups. They explain the following, quote, Regarding the collective organizations involved in worker protests, self-organized worker groups were involved in approximately 80% of cases. These groups of workers were the key form of collective organization in platform protests across the globe, significantly outstripping union organization, either traditional or new. In 48% of the protests that the authors identified, a group of workers acted without the involvement of any other organization. Indeed, in their data, protests where self-organized groups of workers were not involved were far less common than cases where they were. This important finding reflects how platform worker protests is driven by self-organization among workers more so than by union organizing efforts. And they say, clearly this finding rebuts the still widely held belief, but mistaken belief, that unions cause labor unrest, end quote. Indeed, it does. The authors make one more important observation, noting that the protest data shows that when workers self-organize, they are also more uh, inclined to protest not against a single company, but to see their actions as protests against an entire system of companies. The authors make the following point. They say, some genuinely distinctive aspects of platform work became apparent through analysis of our data. In particular, the number of protests that were directed at multiple companies is a distinctive characteristic of platform work, which likely reflects the nature of platform labor markets, where workers often rely on multiple platforms to earn a living. It also suggests that platform workers are well-networked with strengthening sinews of solidarity and, tra uh, and transcend individual companies. It is also important to note that platform labor protests tend to emerge from the bottom up, particularly in the global south, where such protests are overwhelmingly led by informal groups of workers." End quote. Rank and file committees, that is, are emerging organically on Facebook pages, Telegram groups, WhatsApp groups, and in industries like platform labor. And so the IWA RFC striving for the broadest possible unity for a common struggle across country, companies and across countries against not this or that individual boss, but the entire capitalist system addresses this social need. Now the pandemic and the war in Ukraine have had a catastrophic impact on the living conditions of billions of workers all around the world. Due to the pandemic, 1 billion full-time jobs were lost in 2020 and 275 million people fell below the international poverty rate, which is only $3 a day. The impact of the food crisis triggered by the war in Ukraine has thrown billions closer to starvation, and the impact of inflation from the poorest to the most advanced economies has been devastating for workers everywhere. The IMF noted in July that, quote, 71 million people in the developing world have fallen into poverty in just three months, as direct consequence of the global food and energy price surge. 
The impact on poverty rates is drastically faster than the shock of the COVID-19 pandemic, end quote. Under these conditions, the ruling class, squeezed by economic crisis, is preparing to launch an offensive of brutally unprecedented proportions. When we say we follow not the war map, but the map of the class struggle, this is what we're talking about. Here is what the class enemy has planned. According to a 2022 McKinsey Institute report, the intersection of the war in Ukraine, the pandemic, rising inflation, slowing global growth, and the growth of global debt is creating a quote-unquote perfect storm of economic dislocation. In June, the World Bank issued an economic outlook report warning of the threat of prolonged stagflation. This report noted as follows, quote, Forces supporting the global expansion of output in recent decades, which included technological advances, the shift of labor out of agriculture in many emerging markets and developing economies, globalization, and rapid population growth, were strongly disinflationary. As these fade alongside recent supply shocks, inflationary pressures could build, echoing the experience of the 1970s when large supply shocks, accommodative policies, and a fading of structural forces that promoted growth and disinflation triggered prolonged stagflation. Supply disruptions driven by the pandemic and the recent supply shock dealt to global energy and food prices by the war resemble the oil shocks of 1973 and 79 and 80. And between 2021 and 24, global growth is protected to slow by 2.7 percentage points, more than twice as much as between 1976 and 79, end quote. The World Bank also wrote, quote, if inflation remains elevated, the risk will also grow that expectations of higher inflation will become baked into wage behavior, end quote. In other words, as the cost of living spirals out of control, workers are being forced to fight for survival. The actions by the Federal Reserve in the U.S. and central banks in Europe to raise interest rates are aimed first and foremost at reducing wages, creating mass unemployment, and a downward press pressure on wages while doing nothing to alleviate rising prices. One substantial difference between the late 70s and today, however, is unprecedented levels of government debt. The World Bank in June 2022 reports, quote, by comparison with the period of the 1970s, the 2010s featured the fourth and current wave of global debt accumulation involving the largest, fastest, and most broad-based increase in government debt by emerging markets and developing economies in the last 50 years. A number of low-income countries are already either in or near debt distress. The sheer magnitude and speed of the debt buildup heightens the associated risks. Additional vulnerabilities have arisen from increased exposure to non-traditional official creditors and to commercial debt. The com that, combined with the risk of inflation pressures, will force steep monetary tightening among major advanced economies, which raises the specter of a renewed series of financial crises, as in the 1980s. The massive global debt level has been substantially worsened by the corporate bailouts granted during the pandemic, as well as years of quantitative easing. This has raised calls by the IMF and World Bank for ruthless attacks on social programs and workers' wages, who will be made to pay for these policies. African countries' yearly debt payments have quadrupled since 2010, from $17 billion to $58 billion. Interest rate cuts by the imperialist powers are producing a rapid rise of debt servicing costs in these countries. A 2021 economic paper published by the European Network on Debt and Development reviewed IMF plans for the future and warned, quote, of an emerging post-pandemic fiscal austerity shock that is far more severe than one that followed the global financial crisis of 2007 and 8. The hardest hit countries will be the most populous nations, including Vietnam, Indonesia, Nigeria, Brazil, and Egypt, each with a population of over 100 million people. According to the report, quote, Analysis of expenditure projections shows that austerity cuts are expected in 154 countries in 2021 and as many as 159 countries in 22. This trend continues at least until 25, when an average of 139 countries of each year face austerity, which will affect 5.6 billion people, or 75% of the population in 2021, rising to 6 billion, or 85% in 2022.
It is widely recognized that Sri Lanka is a sign of what is to come on a global scale. Reuters quoted World Bank chief economist Carmen Reinhart saying at the, at the end of June that, quote, there are more Sri Lankas on the way. My fear, but I think it's a fear founded on the basis of historical experience, is that to have a comprehensive approach that actually delivers debt reduction will take a long while, years, end quote. This planned offensive, which will continue for many years, has produced concerns over the ability of the trade unions to suppress social discontent. A 2021 report by the International Labor Organization noted that, quote, trade unions generally have welcomed their government's COVID-19 responses, end quote, and that they now confront opposition from below over widespread COVID deaths. According to a 2019 ILO report, the fact that, quote, unions need to revitalize themselves and reach out beyond their present constituency in order to stay relevant is beyond doubt. In both industrialized and developing countries, the trade unions struggle to expand. This narrows their agenda and erodes their legitimacy, the ILO warned. Uh, another ILO report, which goes through the state of the trade unions in every country, um, includes many quotations along basically the same lines. Uh, for example, referencing the main Greek trade union federation, the report notes, quote, the task of expanding GSEE membership is made more difficult because there appears to be little trust in trade unions in Greece, end quote. In Romania, quote, this lack of real dialogue and the rigidity of current arrangements have led to social conflicts in the form of strikes and spontaneous protests, end quote. In France, the ILO complains that workers have, quote, a low level of confidence in the social partners, end quote, which they say is due to, quote, a lack of knowledge about their role, end quote. I mean, that's not true. <laughs> but everywhere, the ruling elite views the unions as social partners and necessary tools to suppress the class struggle and contain their labor force. One Latin American politician told El País in April 22 that with rising prices, quote, if everything doesn't explode, it's because the social organizations are present in the working class neighborhoods, end quote. An Oxford economics report from 2022 notes that unrest in West Africa is inevitable, but that, quote, the best, the best governments can do to placate unrest would be through consultation with unions, a job that will be made even harder by further losses in workers' purchasing power, end quote. Changes in global demography, demography also presage ruthless attacks on the young and the old. The elderly live for too long and waste too much money on medical attention. According to a 2020 report by a former uh, economist at the Bank of England, Charles Goodhart, rising life expectancies are leading to, quote, worsening fiscal problems as medical care and pension expenditures all increase in our aging societies, end quote. What economists cynically call the dependency ratio is rising as baby boomers retire across the world. The problem, according to economists like Goodhart, is that, quote, the young and old who are not working consume but do not produce. And an unhappy aspect of the rise in life expectancy has been the increasing proportion of those with the infirmities of aging, infirmities which do not kill quickly but leave their sufferers incapacitated, end quote, and which therefore burden the state and caregivers. These facts make clear that the ruling class's let-it-rip policy during the pandemic was by design, and that worldwide, governments are raising retirement ages, ages cutting health care to cut life expectancy, and lowering minimum wage requirements to reintroduce forms of child labor, all in collaboration with the unions. At the same time, those under 30 now compromise over half the world's population and two-thirds of the population in sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, and South and Southeast Asia. 2.6 billion people are under the age of 20, there are profound concerns over the radicalizing impact of what economists call the youth bulge. Particularly concerning to analysts is that young people, by and large, do not belong to trade unions. Among OECD countries, unionization rates in the radical generation aged 16 to 25 is less than 5% in Portugal, France, Spain, the US, and Mexico, and less than 10% in Greece, Australia, Italy, the UK, and many others. Um, and this, this point has to be stressed. Uh, this group of young and revolutionary people around the world, young workers, compromise a subs comprise a substantial proportion of the global international proletariat. To review, 
The present situation contains both tremendous dangers and immense revolutionary potential. The prognosis of the decade of socialist revolution is correct. After decades of the suppression of the class struggle, a new era of social explosions has begun. Three waves of re international social struggle have developed in the last decade, with each wave larger and broader than the one that preceded it. The latest wave, the most explosive and international in scope, is spurred by the war and the pandemic. The intractable economic crisis means that ruthless attacks on the working class are forthcoming. This will fuel the explosive growth of strikes and protests everywhere. But the spontaneous upsurge is not enough. There must be socialist leadership. The national trade unions are obstacles on the development of the class struggle, and they are hostile to socialism. The working class is larger and more technologically advanced than ever before, but its consciousness lags of the, its consciousness of its revolutionary role lags behind social being. How the party responds will more and more directly change the course of events. What tasks flow from this assessment? In Comrade David North's speech to the 2019 SEP Summer School, he explained that we are now in the fifth stage of the history of the Trotskyist movement and stressed the task that flows from this assessment. He wrote the following, quote, the International Committee of the Fourth International has begun the fifth stage of the history of the Trotskyist movement. This is a stage that will witness a vast growth of the ICFI as the World Party of Socialist Revolution. The objective processes of economic globalization, identified by the International Committee more than 30 years ago, have undergone a further colossal development. Combined with the emergence of new technologies that have revolutionized communications, these processes have internationalized the working class struggle to a degree that would have been hard to imagine even 25 years ago. The revolutionary struggle of the working class will develop as an interconnected and unified world movement, and the ICFI will be built as the conscious political leadership of this objective socio-economic process. It will counterpose to the capitalist politics of imperialist war, the class-based strategy of world socialist revolution. This is the essential historical task of the new stage in the history of the Fourth International. That's what Comrade David North wrote. The IWA RFC is a critical element of this his essential historical task in the fifth stage. The working class is a revolutionary class under capitalism. Its heterogeneous social and political composition is the product of a complex historical process involving periods of economic boom and bust, the impact of globalization and deindustrialization, waves of mass migration from the countryside to the city and between nation states, technological developments, the weight of religious conceptions, the legacy of past social struggles, the impact of the mass media and political parties, etc. The IWA RFC is a mechanism for encouraging the strivings for independence, for unity, for overcoming barriers based on nationality and identity. It is a lever for workers to use to break the old institutions that have held back the class struggle for so many decades. And it is a training ground for the party to build a powerful vanguard of revolutionary socialist workers to carry out the movement's essential historical task. This is the purpose of our interventions in the working class. In his January 1932 article, What Next?, Trotsky writes the following. The progress of a class toward class consciousness, that is, the building of a revolutionary party which leads the proletariat, is complex and contradictory. The class itself is not homogenous. Its different sections arrive at class consciousness by different paths and at different times. The bourgeoisie participates actively in this process. Within the working class, it creates its own institutions or utilizes those already existing in order to oppose certain strata of workers to others. Trotsky continues, he says, the proletariat moves, for, moves toward revolutionary consciousness not by passing grades in school, but by passing through the class struggle, which abhors interruptions. The task of the party consists in learning from, the, from experience derived from the struggle how to demonstrate to the proletariat its right to leadership. Comrades in the United States have passed through many important political experiences in helping workers create their own institutions through the fight for rank and file committees. 
In concluding this report, I would like to stress one main point about our recent experiences in our interventions in the class struggle. In case after case, the party was able, even with very limited resources, to dramatically alter the course of critical struggles and substantially increase the party's stature in the American working class. Any number of examples could be given. In the strike of hospital workers in California earlier this year, the presence of a very small number of party members threw the hospital and the unions into crisis, greatly empowering the nurses and facilitating a rebellion that paved the way for the growth of the healthcare workers rank and file committee across the country. This committee has held meetings involving dozens and even hundreds of nurses from across the country and played a prominent position in the campaign to defend Redonda Vought. Deep opposition among nurses to Vought's prosecution forced the state to issue the most mild sentence possible for fear of triggering wildcat strikes nationwide. In our intervention among parts workers at Dana last summer and fall, the party facilitated the rejection of a sellout contract and established a committee linking workers across multiple states, uncovering deplorable conditions of 84-hour work weeks and winning broad respect for our coverage of the death of a Dana worker named Danny Walters, whose widow, Marcia, has just issued a powerful statement in support of Comrade Will Lehman's campaign for UAW president. In Lehman's campaign, the political development of a revolutionary auto worker uh, has allowed the party to challenge not only the UAW dictatorship, but also the federal government, which hope it could block us from participating in the presidential election by requiring that he win the nomination of delegates at the convention that took place this past month in Detroit. We have just proven that they underestimated us, and a fundamental takeaway from this Congress must be that it would be the greatest political danger for our movement to underestimate itself and its impact uh, uh, and the impact of our interventions on the growth of the class struggle. A number of additional examples can be given. But in each of these campaigns, we have placed the question of socialism before workers, not in a didactic or formal way, but we have attempted to show the workers that their experiences make clear they must take up political questions in their striving for unity and independence. This is not to suggest that we should be content with the impact that we can have with just a couple of people here and there. We must recruit in the working class, and we must, and as we do, our influence on masses of workers will grow exponentially. We must establish a substantial presence in critical factories, warehouses, schools, and workplaces now so that we can exert the maximum degree of political influence on the movement in the United States as it continues to grow and develop. We have to learn to forge political relations with workers, to speak to workers regularly and not merely when a contract is expiring, not to lecture workers, but to educate them about socialism through their experiences, not to adapt to present levels of consciousness, but to elevate their aspirations and expunge their illusions in capitalism. Our interventions must be planned as carefully as possible in advance, prepared through thorough political discussion and aggressively carried out with a high degree of professionalism and coordination. Interventions must be followed through their lessons must be discussed and internalized so that they can be made the property of the party and of the class and brought forward into the next struggles. We must proceed from the understanding that we are active participants at the center of every struggle, not passive observers commenting from without. And this can only be done by a cater which is trained in the historical experiences of the International Committee and is prepared to dedicate themselves to fighting for our perspective in the working class. It will require the active, dedicated, and consistent work of all comrades without exception. This is not a party for individuals who will not carry out the work required, uh, who, who do not communicate with their branch secretaries who are not actively engaged in any specific area of work. Behind such abstentionism, there is always a political outlook rooted in a belief that the working class is not really a revolutionary social force, and that position is wrong. In conclusion, I just want to make one more quote from Trotsky's speech in the School of Revolutionary Strategy. Trotsky said the following, 
He said, the task of the working class consists in counterposing to the thorough, thoroughly thought out counter-revolutionary strategy of the bourgeoisie, its own revolutionary strategy, likewise thought out to the end. In this struggle, the party, which is actually moving steadily to the head of the working class, has to maneuver, now attacking, now retreating, always consolidating its influence, conquering new positions until the favorable moment arises for the overthrow of the bourgeoisie. Comrades, this is a time for attacking and conquering new territory. Here, in the center of world political reaction, we must aggressively develop a section of the American working class that is prepared to fight for socialist revolution. On this basis, we can build the IWA RFC, unleash the tremendous potential power of the working class, end imperialist war, crush the threat of fascism, and cut a path to socialist revolution.